Welcome to Hard Questions. This is where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. William R. Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Pastor Buck Schaefer, Grace Life Church, Monroeville and North Hills. Pete Giacalone, lead pastor, South Hills Assembly of God Church, Bethel Park. G. Anthony Gilbert, pastor of Another Level in Mount Washington. Pastors, thank you for being with us. These are good guys right here, everybody, all four of them. Oh. Uh, I enjoy this time getting together, having the chance to, to talk about the Word of God and, and the things of God. And today on Hard Questions, we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, some different things, frustration with God, you know, that's the, so let's start there. And Pete, I'd like to get your, your take on this. Can we be frustrated with God and not sin? Okay, I'm sorry, I, I, I did not see that one. Uh, uh, I was I was prepared for what does it mean to find God? All right, <laughs> so this is a curveball thrown at me. Uh, can we? Be, I think there's times. Yes, I think there. I, I, if you if you look at the life of David, I believe there's times in David's life where, where uh, when, who was it that reached up and touched the Ark of the Covenant? It was a, it was yeah, a, uh, David was angry with God. It, yeah. it, it flustered David, and and there was other times when 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 things took place. Uh, uh, where, yes, I believe as a believer, you can be frustrated with God. And, um, and in that frustration, uh, it goes like back to be angry, but sin not. So don't allow that frustration, just like don't allow your anger to lead you to sin. Yeah, yeah. there's, Tom, you've shared with me mm -hmm. that when you guys lost a baby some years ago, uh, yeah. that... Yeah, well, yeah, it was, you know, we were, uh, it's a terrible situation. I ran out of gas all the way to the hospital while Gene's having a miscarriage, and I started yelling at God about what, what are you doing? What are you doing? So there's a, there was a frustration, and I don't think I was sinning because I kind of think God can handle it. What do you think, Buck? I think so. <laughs> you know, we all come to these places, in, in the, the, like at the end of the road, and kind of, God, what are you doing? But again, I, I think that when you see God's nature, that he is good, you yes. always revert back to his goodness, even though you're frustrated yeah. and he's come through and I always meditate on his faithfulness. Mm -hmm. He's come through this time, this time, this time. So frustration now, as I get a little more mature, it, it doesn't last that long. Oh, that's good, that's good. You know, it's funny you mentioned about Uzzah and just as you were talking here, uh, the Holy Spirit just kind of dropped this in my mind about how don't allow your frustration to become content. You know, to where, you know, yeah. Uzzah thought, oh, I become familiar with God so I can touch him. You know, so a lot of times don't allow your anger to touch his glory, his honor, Ooh. his name, you know, where you begin to speak out against him. You know, it's kind of like when the children of Israel, when they came out, you brought us out here to die, didn't you? Like almost like he's evil now because he's allowing you to go through it. And I think that's the line. It's not the fact of being frustrated or like, what are you up to? Or man, this is so, you know, that, that's all fine. It's when all of a sudden he's evil. His motives are bad. He's a bad God. And like you said about his goodness, that's where I think we have to be careful of that. That's where you get into now, not just doubt, you are fall into that sin of unbelief. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think that's where the line needs to be drawn. Yeah, that's a good point. You got anything to add there? Well, you know, we're human beings. Yeah. And because we're human beings, you know, we're, we're going to get frustrated with God. I think the key is not staying frustrated, mm -hmm. you know, with him. And I always uh, go back to my illustration, and I know I've said it on here before, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, you know, you go back to those Looney Tune cartoons, right? Where they would slap the guy, you know? And sometimes, you know, I mean, you get frustrated and, and that's understandable. But if you stay in that state of frustration, you know, sometimes yeah. you need a Looney Tune slap, yeah, you know, yeah. just to bring you back to reality and say, okay, you know, I got that out. You know, uh, now I'm, you know, I can refocus. Uh, so I think that that's the key, not staying frustrated. Yeah. I'm going to give you the number to the Looney Tune slap hotline. <laughs> Pastor Bill will come over and, and fix you up. Uh, I think that that's so key, guys, because uh, the Psalms, how long, oh God, yeah, you know, yeah, and things yeah. like that. There's a frustration. Will you forsake me forever. Yeah, yeah there's a frustration that, that can come, but we finally have to have that anchor of who he really is Amen. and his character. So let's move on to the second one, if we, if we can. What does it mean to find God? Pastor Bill. Well, you know, the one clear verse that I see in the scripture is in Jeremiah chapter 29, where the uh, people of Israel were in Babylonian captivity and, uh, you know, he told them they were going to be there for 70 years. But he said in the midst of that, he said, and you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So to 
find God, you know, I think it means three things. Uh, first of all, I think it means that you sense his presence, that if you found God, that means that that you have sensed his presence in your life, that that, you know, you you know that he walks with you and he talks with you. I think a second thing is it means that you have seen his character and you have seen his power demonstrated in your life. You know, if you haven't found him, you know, you're not going to be able to know his character. You're not going to be able to know who he is. You're not going to be able to see his power. And then I believe that to see, to find God is to see him move in mighty ways in your life. You know, to see, you know, prayers being answered, to see, you know, mountains being moved, to see uh, great things being done. So, you know, to find God, I, I think it's just not like hide and seek where you go find somebody and say, okay, I found you. But when you find him, it opens up a whole new arena of, of the, the fullness of God, his presence, his character, his power, and to see him work in a mighty way. Yeah, amen. And, and, and again, if I can just throw another scripture out, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. And, and it's, again, we were the ones who were lost. God was never lost. So in accepting the finding Christ in our life mm -hmm. out, out of our lostness, yes. Uh, I think that's what we need to realize is we, we were the lost ones, not God, you know, or I, f I found this and we found new life in him. Right. He's really found us, right. <laughs> I think is, right. is probably yeah. the more accurate way to say it. Buck, what do you think of this? You know, I think that uh, he who finds God finds life, the Zoe life of God. But, you know, you can find him in the word. His word is a lamp under your feet, yes. a light under your path. But if you're even just a rank heathen, the Bible says in <coughs> Romans 1, no one will have an excuse because his glory is revealed in the firmament. You can mm. see how things are created. Yeah, you watch a baby be born. I think God is, is like that. And I, I don't believe we'll have an excuse you know, for not really seeing God. And the Holy Spirit's whole job is to reveal to every human being. That, that Jesus is alive. There's a God who loves you and it's painted everywhere. Yeah. Even Amen. on the sunset. I, I think you guys pretty much said it, you yeah. know, to find God. It's, he's, he's got to reveal himself and he puts in us a seek to find him. He does it all, but then he just makes himself manifest to you and that's what's so awesome about it. Well, I think maybe, maybe again, it, it might be a time for us to take a moment and, and Buck, maybe you could speak to someone out there who says they, they haven't really found God or they feel like they lost God or they don't know where God is. Could you just speak to, look at the camera to you share know, with someone? <laughs> God loves people. And wherever you are, the Bible says that God so loved you. I think this is revealed in the scripture, but it's, it's revealed in the earth. God so loved that he gave himself for you. That all he asks, as we talked about earlier, whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And he's passionately in love with you. Doesn't matter what problems you have, what issues you have, he wants to connect with you. While we were yet in sin, Christ died. He's not mad at you, he's not upset with you. He didn't put sickness on you, he is a good God. He's the same yesterday today, today and forever. And he loves you and he's pursuing you. And all you have to do is invite him. Jesus Christ, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Acknowledge that we're sinners and we need help. And all of a sudden with this humility, the rush of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ comes into your life and makes you a brand new creature. And nothing's impossible when you just believe that and confess it with your mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead and he is the son of God and you make him your Lord and savior, do it right now. I just ask you, I encourage you, do it right now and watch the change that takes place in your life. Amen. That's Amen. something that we have all come to. Everyone that's on this panel, everyone that works here, everyone that, that, you know, that, that names the name of Christ, we've come to that place where we laid down our own lordship of our life and said, Lord, we, we're gonna follow you. We're gonna take that upon ourselves. If you, if you, did, uh, if you wanna know more about that, you can always call our prayer line. We have a 24 seven prayer line here. So the number's there on your screen. We can call, you can call the prayer line and you can say, I wanna know more mm -hmm. of what it means to follow Jesus. Well, stay tuned. We'll be back in just 60 seconds when we ask, what does it mean to fear God? We'll be right back. Welcome back to Hard Questions. Well, we've talked about frustration. We've talked about 
finding. Now we're going to talk about fearing. And I, I want to go to you first, Buck. What does it mean to fear God? You know, I want to make sure that we're clear. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Fear produces stress, anxiety, worry, chaos in your body and your mind. But this, as the scripture says, uh, you know, fear is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I, I would say, you know, with my sons, they don't, they don't fear me. They love me. And they're kind of concerned if they don't do what I ask them to do. So <laughs> you that, might call that fear. <laughs> right. But what I'm saying is this, this kind of it's, it's not connected to anxiety. It's actually connected to reverence, yes. like this awe, this respect, like God is. I fear God like, you know, it's a fearful thing to fall into the presence of an angry God. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, the reality is I, I don't think God's angry. And uh, if you study who he is in the word, you find out that when you come into his presence, there's this incredible awe and reverence and respect for God that I, I'm more fearful that I don't do his word. I'm more fearful and respect that I want to treat my wife as Christ treats the church and loves her. I, I, want, to, I want to fall in line with this. And, and as the father loves his sons, he corrects them. That's not a fearful thing. You don't want your child to grow up and be a, a bastard child. So therefore, who the father loves, he corrects. That's where that reverence is. You didn't think when you were a kid, you thought your dad, man, he's, he, but as you got older, you thought, man, he loved me. He really loved mm -hmm. me. He corrected yeah. me. Yeah, right, so there right, was this, right. now I look back at my father, yeah. you know, when you're mature and you go, man, I really love him yeah. for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And so you see the guidelines to God's word and you go, he loves me. He, he chasteneth who he loves. So I think that pulls into that respect that awe that's yeah. that's that spirit of love that actually casts out all fear because it's that perfect love Boy, that, that that is really good and I, I think we get so confused about this word what do you what do you say about this yeah I, I, instead of using the word fear i'd say to his point honor and respect mm -hmm. you know when you fear god it's it's kind of funny though having a reverential fear to some okay. degree it's almost like you have a healthy fear right. of yes. what he can do too. Exactly. You know, like for example, exactly. like my sons don't fear me, but right. they do know if they get out of line, they have exactly. something to be afraid of. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not yeah. of me, but of what may happen to them. So I think there's a reverential thing of realizing. Yes. Right. And when I think about that reverential fear, he honors his word. Right. So like you said, it's not even afraid of like, oh my gosh, if I don't do this, what All is right. he going to do? But it's also the fact of the matter, like if I do it, he'll honor it. I respect him, so I want to follow his word because it completely, it, that word is going to hold up no matter what. So it's having that ability to know that he is who he says he is. He's going to That's uphold right. what he says he's going to uphold. He's going to do what he says he's going to do, good and bad, up, down, and all around. And I think that's really what it means to fear God. And that's why the Bible also said it's the beginning of all wisdom. Right of wisdom. there, Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Yeah. So, uh, and I loved what you said, Jay, just a moment ago. It's reverential fear. Yeah. That's, that's what God wants from us. And it, I, again, there's a, the, other, the flip side of that is to be fearful if we're on the wrong side of God. I don't want to be on the wrong side of God. I want to have that healthy reverence that, uh, you know, what's that old song? I stand, I stand in all oh. of you. Mm -hmm. That reverential fear. Yeah. Well, I'll just piggyback because I was getting ready to say the same thing you just said. The awe. It's, it's standing in awe yep. of God. And, uh, you know, I think of uh, when Jonah was running from God and how that when he was on the boat and uh, he was sleeping downstairs and God sent that storm. And then the uh, sailors called him up and said, man, call on your God. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Jonah said, I'm a Hebrew. And, you know, he said, throw me overboard. And they said, no. Nah. And they rode harder. Yeah. And then they, Jonah finally convinced them to throw him overboard. And he threw him overboard. And it said that the, the mariners, they feared God. Now here, here, here was some heathen, right. you know, that, that didn't know God mm -hmm. and, and now they fear him. You know, right. they, they, they stood in awe of, of God. So right. I think, you know, the idea of reverential respect, but that, that, that heightened element of reverential respect is the awe, yes. you know, where I just kind of, I just kind of like, uh, wow, you know. <laughs> you know, the whole thing about fear, uh, obviously I've heard it referred to as reverence and that certainly is a good definition. And we've talked about that. There was some things like those sailors that were, there was a, a different kind. There was a, a magnification of the name of God because of what happened. I was 
doing some research for this, and you know where the seven sons of Sceva tried to cast out, and, and they couldn't do it, and they were, they were uh, you know, uh, sons of a Jewish rabbi or something they tried to cast out by using the name of Jesus, you know, who Paul preaches, they said. And the demon said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? And they, he got, they got all beat up by this guy. And it says here, and this became known to all, both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus and fear fell on, upon them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. And that's, that's you know, that's an awesome name, that name of Christ. Yeah. It, Powerful. Isn't that the same thing that happened in Ananias and Sapphira? Yeah. Like they fell dead Beautiful. at the door and it was like there was a fearful awe and a reverence not like, many don't play. Not, yeah, not many yeah. people joined up. <laughs> right. Well, that's a, some good discussion there. Moving on to the next question. Uh, important one. Jay, how, when, how do we receive the Holy Spirit? Well, you know, you have a couple of different places there. Obviously you receive what we would call, a lot of people call the indwelling or infilling when you get saved. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't be born again without having the Holy Spirit within you. But I don't know if they're referring to that, so I'll hit that one real quickly. The moment we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in, does the work of what we call regeneration, and now he's living inside. But then there's that baptism of the Holy Spirit that we get as they got in the day of Pentecost for service. Uh, to be witnesses. Um, and for me, in my opinion, I think that's one of the, it, it needs to be preached more now than I ever. Agree. And the reason why is because that is the only demonstration we have. Because people can say, I don't believe that. But if you resurrect somebody from the dead, they can say what they want to say. <laughs> if somebody gets out of a wheelchair, you know, that power was meant to be a witness. As yeah, a matter of fact, exactly. he even told Peter, he told the church, you go up there and hang out there in the, yeah. whole, uh, in the upper room because you can't even be my bride or my church until you get it. Peter tried and we saw what happened to him. Yeah. But once he got filled with the Holy Ghost, something in his life changed. So how do we get it? It's simple, you ask. Yeah. You know, you ask, but it's a life of consecration. It's not just, well, Lord, give me this, but I wanna keep living the way I want. You wanna be yielded to the Holy Spirit because you're asking him to use you. You're asking him to be a vessel. And in order to do that, there's usually steps and things you need to do in order to position yourself to be able to receive. So it's developing a hunger and a passion and just asking for that. And then he'll fill us if we're willing to be obedient to him. All right, uh, I, I love that. I, I always think about how much more will he give the Holy Spirit to those, those who, who ask? ask. Yeah, but, I agree. Yeah. He said, if you ask for bread, will I give you a stone? If you ask for a fish, will I give you a scorpion? How much more will a father give good things to them who ask? Yeah. And I, I think the important thing people see is in this day and hour we live in, there's that subsequent, like Jay was saying, being born of the Spirit, according to John 3, and then being filled with the Spirit to be a witness and the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you and, and where Jesus said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. And I think in the last days, I think probably the most important oh, thing man. is that the church knows yeah. how to be filled yeah. with the Spirit yeah. according to yeah. Ephesians oh, 5. No. Yeah. Don't be drunk with wine, we're in yeah. express. He says right before that, the days are evil, but be ye being filled is the original translation with the Holy Spirit, speaking unto yourself psalms, hymns, spiritual psalms, making melody in your heart. This infilling, I love what the Moffat's translation said, be being filled. In other words, this is an ongoing, yeah. Yeah. you know, call upon God to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but live a life with the evidence of a Holy Spirit filled life. Amen. As Jay said, laying hands on the sick, praying in other tongues, believing God to walk in all the power that Jesus did and more. Well, that's good. For uh, dominion. Just, just right. uh, with one, one minute left, Pastor Bill, give me your perspective on this. Well, you know, again, I, I like what these brothers said. I, you know, how, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? Well, ask Jesus Christ as, okay. as to be your Lord and Savior. Because Romans 8 9 says, if you have not the Spirit of God, you are none of His. Yeah. So that's, that says that you are not even saved if you don't have the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So when you ask Christ to come into your life, the Holy Spirit comes in at that point too. Now what do you think about that, that uh, continual being filled with the Holy Spirit? How's that, how, how, how do you interpret that? Well, you know, I, I think that as we go through life that, you know, there's things that come along that take away our filling. You know, we may get in the flesh. You know, I, I may get angry. You know, maybe my wife and I might have some intense fellowship, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that might take away the filling. So, you know, you have, you have to go and say, okay, you know, get that, get, you know, get the filling again. But I believe that there, the filling is, is over and over again. Whereas the coming of the Holy Spirit is a one-time thing, I believe the filling is, is a continual you thing. Be continually yeah. filled, that is so good. Uh, we're just gonna take a quick break. And when, we're, when we come back, we're gonna go to our hotline question of the week. We'll be right with you.
I love it when we go to the hotline question. And this week's hotline question, it's a confusing one for our viewer. Let's take a listen. Hi, I'm calling about 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18. Paul's talking to Timothy about two preachers, I guess. And he says in verse 18, they claim that the resurrection has already taken place and they undermine the faith of some. But if he, Paul wrote this in like 60-something A.D., the resurrection would have taken place. So that's confusing to me. I'm hoping to get clear understanding of what he means by resurrection in verse 18. Thank you so much for your question. I love the, the clarity that you shared that with, and I want to hand this off to Pastor Glaze. What, what, what do you think this is talking about here? Yeah, well, you know, in the first century, there were all type of uh, strange philosophies going around. There was Gnosticism, Stoicism, you know, so there was all kind of ideas going around. And so one of the things that was, that was going around, and that's why, you know, it's so important to study the word, uh, and, and that's why John gave warnings, Paul gave warnings as to false teachers, uh, because one of the things that went around it was that when you got saved, that that was the resurrection, that your spirit was resurrected. And they didn't believe in a bodily resurrection. So they believed in a spirit resurrection. So when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, that at that moment, my spirit resurrected. And so what they were saying is that, well, the resurrection is already passed. That when you got saved, you were, you were resurrected. So I don't think that what is, I don't believe it's here talking about the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because according, you know, and the lady was correct, you know, that Christ had already resurrected, you know, so it was past. Uh, so, you know, when, when they, these guys are talking here, they're talking about a spiritual resurrection when you get saved. Okay, all right, Pete? Well, I, ha I have to agree with Doc, but, but again, uh, the idea of, of did the resurrection and, and of course we're awaiting, we're look, this is our hope, we're looking forward to the resurrection, the, the bodily resurrection uh, and the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will one day quicken, is quickening our bodies now, but one day we're going to have that bodily resurrection, which is, I believe, futuristic and not already. Yeah, right. And, and, and so, again, to make that distinction, this, is, this was a false doctrine. Right. You know, that these guys taught false doctrine. So, yeah. But they're saying yeah. the resurrection of the had all, of the body had already taken place? No, no, no. the spirit. That the when you spirit. got saved, your spirit was resurrected. Okay. And so in that yeah. sense, the resurrection has already passed. Okay, and it says upset the faith of some. Yeah, right. it, yeah. 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 Well, I think, and I wonder, are they also referring to the fact of the resurrection, speaking of the rapture? As well, that it's already happened. Are they referring to that as well? It's not the, the, the talk. fault, but I'm talking about that's why their faith was thought, a little. That's what I thought this was alluding to. Yeah, and I'm yeah. thinking that they're like, oh man, I missed it. You know, kind of like when you watched The Thief in the Night when you was a kid. I don't know if y'all yeah. watched that. Oh, I yeah. yeah. Several times. <laughs> if, I, if I called home and they prayed, I was like, I'm going to hell. You know, I thought that was it. I didn't you know? want to go through the tribulation <laughs> oh, at man, all. Man, man, not no after way. watching those videos. Uh, but you know, another thing that she mentioned too, and I thank you, Dr. Glaze, for clearing that up. She had mentioned, she said, um, if Paul wrote this in 60 something AD, the resurrection would have already taken place. I think she's also thinking the resurrection, of the body of Christ. That's what yeah. she's thinking. Right. So right. where's yeah, the right. issue yeah. with that? She's trying to figure out why that's there. But as you cleared up, he's talking about a different type of resurrection, not right. the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension. Yeah, because so. there was a lot of false teaching yeah. Yeah, yeah. going on. Well, yeah. I agree with you. The false teaching was going on. Some of that is today with questions, but the end of the scripture, they are undermining the faith of some. And to address that, he says, but the firm foundation of God stands sure. Amen. The Lord knows those who are his. So I think those keys to answer these questions that where there's some questioning is number one, the word of God's a lamp under our feet and a light under a path. And number two, the Bible says that those who are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. So we need to follow the leading of the spirit of God and not fall for these games that Dr. Glaze was talking about, because a lot of people can yeah. get deluded by them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's interesting that it, Paul in 1 Thessalonians, he says that we should comfort one another with these words that about, about being caught up in the air with the Lord. And here the exact opposite was happening. Right, right. They were being Confused. all, uh, you know, uh, feeling like they had missed something. Well, you know what, if you look at a couple of verses above it, I always say read verses below, right. but this time, Look at a couple of verses above. In verse 16 it says, but shun, so Doc, we're there, profane and idle babblings, yep. for they will increase 
to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. cancer. It just yeah. eats yeah. everything up. So, I mean, again, we, we you know, there's, there's a lot that, to, to dig into there, but it's a great question. Uh, certainly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ happened, yes. and the yes. resurrection of our bodies and the, uh, of being with the Lord is going to happen too. Uh, you know, and don't let idle babblings, idle, don't let, don't yeah, let strange doctrines buck alluded to that. Don't let strange ideas upset your faith. Stay the course, follow That's after right. Christ. You, 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 no, and, real quick too. Real quick. Uh, 215, <laughs> study to show yourself Shall approved. Study to show yourself approved. It's, right, it's right before that. It's yeah. right before that's that. Right. Uh, and, and, you, know, uh, you know, that's the important thing. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's program, Study to Show Yourself Approved, and we want to hear from you. Email us your questions at hardquestions at ctvn.org or call into our hotline at 412-349-4326. Have a great day in the Lord.